Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Andrew Miller, Principal SC with Pure Storage. We are here today to talk about ransomware jail, how to make bail. That's, that's the question we're never asking for ourselves, always for our friends. The reason I'm actually here today is, uh, frankly, I started on the customer side for about seven years, security background, partner side for a while, working with folks, excellent folks like Netsync, as well as even have been talking about ransomware for better or worse for much too long. Maybe I need an intervention kind of thing. What we're gonna talk about today in the first section, hope you'll join us for the later sections. The first section is actually around the threat. Well, you're gonna see pure storage on the screen. We're not actually gonna talk very much about pure storage. We're talking about the landscape and how, how attackers actually get in and what has changed from worms and viruses for the last 20 or 30 years. Sections two and three will go into defense in depth and then even specifically where pure helps you. Okay, so let's start basic. We're not gonna make it too basic though. We know we wish that life was like this when we're as a customer, you know, and maybe even today, we can work from the beach with, with what's been happening with remote work and everything else. But in reality, life is more like this. We've got tickets coming in nonstop. There's new projects, there's new patches and firmware and everything going on. And into the middle of all this comes ransomware, right? And I, I like to read fiction, sometimes dystopian fiction. Like, how did we get into this really crazy place? You can't almost turn over the news or look at a news story online and see more about this. Okay, let's start. Basic and we're gonna build our way up. We'll not stay basic for too long. Base definition, ransomware, you know, like it says there. Type of malicious software encrypts your data. Until you pay money, you're not gonna get it back. If we're gonna have a little bit of fun with it, maybe be a little bit snarky here. This is where you're actually in a recovery scenario where it's using systems that weren't designed for it to bring back massive amounts of data. You asked me, when I was a backup admin, you're at a college, hey, if I, can I restore 50% of my data center from backups really fast? I'd look at you just kind of sideways because that's not what I've like built, run the system for and it's not what the guy before me built it for, you know, that kind of thing. It's just not really what it's meant for. But in some cases, often with ransomware, we're running into that scenario, going a little bit further. So we know generally gets in via endpoints, laptops, desktops, et cetera. And often humans, we as humans are the weakest link. That's not criticizing myself or other employees, right? But this is how it gets in. This is either spear phishing or getting in through zero day browser attacks, et cetera. The best thing I like to do here is tell stories. I've talked about this topic a, a lot <laughs> over the last couple of years. And often people don't want to come up, you know, during, my employees are, raise their hand during the Q&A, but they'll come up after the presentation and we'll, we'll talk about stuff. So for example, a gentleman in Toronto, the day before I presented, he got an email that looked like it was from iTunes and for a $50 app purchase, $49.99. Now, if for you or for me or for hopefully you, that's not make or break money, but it's still a good bit of money for an app. So you're thinking, what did I or my wife or my kids buy? The only thing wrong with that email was the dispute this purchase link. And that went to a site you wouldn't have intended. And maybe there, you know, now we're into the territory of like the US government six months ago, put out a warning to patch Firefox. US government about Firefox, an open source free browser. Yeah, because there was a zero day attack there or there was a lady in accounts payable. She was processing payments like she usually does, came in early, opened up a PDF that looked like it was from an established vendor and her machine got compromised. Or, you know, I've, I've got children, you know, significant others, children, spouses, loved ones. What if you get an email that says there's been a security event somewhere and to click here for more information to know if they're safe? You're not thinking, hey, is, is this a ransomware attack or a phishing attack? You're thinking, I need to know what's going on with my loved ones, right? Now, we are starting to see attacks that aren't just going in and encrypting right away, but going further. This is another story, got to anonymize it. SQL DBA doing his job, working on databases. He goes in, his machine gets infected. Not necessarily his fault, right? You know, based on what we talked about. And from there, it doesn't encrypt stuff on his local machine right away. It reaches out across the network, encrypts the SQL backups, the MDF, the LDF files. Then it reaches out, it backups, then it reaches out across and encrypts the actual databases, and then encrypts his machine to be the definition of a really, really bad day, right? But what we're seeing is it's actually going further than that now. A couple years ago, when I would discuss this, the idea of targeted attacks on data protection methods, you know, erase snapshots and backups, that was theoretical. We are now seeing this today. There are multiple stories out there. Some of them I try to be careful with because they've actually become pure customers over the course of this. So don't say names. And we get into the idea of the anatomy of an attack and how does that play out. now. The reason I like to discuss this is because it is not get in, encrypt your stuff right away and you're done. The average attack length in 2018 was 206 days, in 2019, 
was around 55 days. These numbers are a little mushy because no one exactly wants to, you, you, no one is actually disclosing all this stuff or they don't want to, they don't want to be in the news. But the key here is that attackers get in and they're almost doing what I used to do and even some of the services that NextSync offers around application discovery or network discovery or analysis, all this kind of stuff. They're doing this so that they can get access to as much as possible. So the day before they start encryption, they go to try and kick off removing the methods that would stop you from needing to pay a ransom. They attack the methods of data protection, backups, snapshots, et cetera. Then they kick off the encryption. And the key piece here is that actually, when we think about this from anatomy of attack, it's that they're in for a long time, but also when I'm thinking about, do I have my data in a non-encrypted format, that I have it as before the point of the encryption. That's not 200 days or 50 days. That's usually one or two or three days, right? Because once your data starts to get encrypted, you know right away. We'll sometimes see screens like this. There's often, to be honest, an element of time. You can kind of see on the bottom there that says, you know, you have to pay right away. We're trying to short circuits our brains. We've got to make really hard decisions really quickly. This is thanks to Microsoft Research, an example of a Ryuk attack chain. No one's talking about, you know, they're spending a while. You can actually see, you know, they're kind of going all the way down and thinking about how can you get to the holy grail, even Active Directory credentials. Now, if we take that one step further, that's where we get into the idea of immutability. And you may have heard of this already. Immutability at core is the concept that my data can't be modified, my backups, my data protection methods can't be modified. But now, as you just heard, it's not just about immutability, it's if someone has admin credentials or access to even my backup systems, to my purpose-built backup appliance, can they delete my methods of data protection? You know, when I used to talk about this for a while, um, CryptoLocker was actually one of the best known names. If you're, if you're playing the at-home game, you might know what this one is. Uh, this was actually WannaCry. This is the one where, uh, for, for fo friends and family, that all they know is really that uh, he, he does computer stuff, right, kind of thing. This is the one they heard about, stories in USA Today, and this is really bad, and this is, this is pretty crazy, right? Because it even got to the point where this was actually um, in a Deutsche Bahn train station, like, you know, so coming through Dallas or Atlanta, and you see the overhead displays with departures and arrivals. And you're kind of laughing a little bit when you see a Windows blue screen of death. Like, this is the equivalent of that, but in Germany, right? So it, it's all in, it's in front of us very much. Now, when I'm talking about this in person, and thank you for listening online, often I'll say, you know, my goal, my job is to scare you somewhat, to scare you in a good way, right? Because the world's gotten scarier. It's not slowing down. It's far better to think about this at 10 a.m. or 12 p.m. or 2 p.m. Whenever you're listening to this versus 2 a.m. in the morning when you get a call about something has gone wrong. And the fascinating part here is this isn't just me saying this. We're seeing this now at an executive level. So you may not be able to read all of this, but the key thing is this is a Gartner survey about digital transformation spending priorities, you know, just, just like it says at the top. And I'm not entirely sure what digital transformation is. I think for a lot of you, it's like, ah, well, digital transformation can be buzzwords, it can be real, but whatever it is, it, I don't think of cyber and information security as being far and away the number two spending priority. I think of some of the other stuff up there, like business intelligence and AI and analytics, like that's digital transformation. But at an executive level, this is that important. And sometimes when I'm going through and not just talking about you know, ransomware, I'm talking about the pure portfolio and my role where I do kind of an executive overview, I'll maybe make a 30 second comment and maybe a half hour presentation about ransomware. And that's most commonly the things that executives come back and say like, you, you sound credible, please tell me more about that 30 seconds and not all the rest of what you talked about. There's real executive focus here. So where did this come from? We've had worms and viruses with us for a long time, right? And I was actually a Silicon Valley company that went from about 200 employees to 1,300 employees in two years. Okay, five, five X growth, five and a half X growth. Like, and this is hyper growth. This is even surpassing that as you can see. And the other key thing to note here is it's not just, this is not ransoms paid. This is actually the impact, the organizational, reputational, financial impact. So this is almost hyper growth based and it's not slowing down as you can see. We almost knew this might happen. We had the, the beginnings, the inklings of it in 2015, 2016. There was an FBI special agent, Joseph Bonavolanta. He was presenting at a small regional conference and someone caught him during a Q&A session afterwards where he was quoted as saying, to be honest, the ransomware is often just that good. We recommend people pay. Now, that got out a small paper, a medium paper, a large paper, the FBI had to walk it back because that can't be the official recommendation. It can't be, that, you know, you can't feed the beast, right? But we saw this going on then, and we've seen high profile targets since then. The day after Thanksgiving, SF Muni got hit. 
no fares collected on the on the kiosk where you pay, you know, to take the bus or the train, et cetera. It said you hacked. I think of two different school systems, one in Myrtle Beach, uh, close to where I live, actually. Uh, they got hit. And when they went to restore from their backups, it was a little bit of what I used to be sometimes as a backup admin. You know, you're a sad backup panda. You've got all the red failed backup jobs every morning. That was what they found. It wasn't even compromised backups. It was just that the backups hadn't been running the way they thought they were. Another system, a school system actually in Houston chose not to pay the ransom. They spent three teacher days, this is productivity, salary, recovering. It gets even more real when we think about human life and impact. Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center got hit. For seven days, they could not dispatch ambulances, affected CT scans, EMR. At the end of seven days, they paid the ransom. Now, the, the key, the, the, the sad thing is that they did get back online, but guess what happened 30 days later? They got hit. Again, this is a whole industry, and sometimes even the information is being sold. So there's a little bit of a you know, kind of like blank if you do and, and blank if you don't and insert work appropriate words there into that phrase. Like this is a problem regardless. And it's not a question of when you get hit, if you get hit, but when. And the key challenges that we often see, and we'll dial into this in the second and third sections, are not just around data accessibility. Do I fundamentally have my data? I should have multiple layers of defense, which I'll explore in the next section. But also, once I know that I have my data for protection, can I actually restore quickly enough to avoid major reputational, financial, organizational impact? Now, the last concept here that goes into why this is not, it's, a, it's not an if question, but a when question. We've had worms and viruses with us for a long time. We can have fun on Wikipedia going through computer history and IT history. So what has changed here? Two key things. First, Think about ransomware, right? Ransom. How do we used to pay ransoms? You know, in, in general, it was you know, a briefcase of physical currency left somewhere. The first big thing that's changed is cryptocurrency. Now, I like to be careful here. I'm not trying to have a political, ethical, economic commentary on cryptocurrency, but what it does provide is a relatively reliable, relatively anonymous way to transfer money outside of jurisdictional boundaries. Now, there are some cases where uh, Bitcoin or other, other Ethereum, et cetera, they get tracked, but it's usually if you get a state actor really unhappy with you, that's not usually most of us. It's not the kind of thing, right? And then you look at that and you think, in the case of Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center, the ransom that they paid was only $17,000. Sometimes it's a lot more, sometimes less. But let's think about what is the average salary for developers in the US? You know, it's around 67,000 kind of thing, 69,000. And you go outside the US. Now, this is not a you know a political geographical comment, it's just about cost of living. And now we're in economics. This is part of why I find this a fascinating, this topic a fascinating intersection of, of e economics, finance, and technology. So you have developers around the world that actually for them, $17,000 might be several years worth of income, right? We're used to the idea of outsourcing. That's some of what this is, right? And Bitcoin frees that up from a monetary transfer standpoint. Weave that into, there are literally ransomware as a service kits today that you can purchase online. This is on the, the dark web. Sometimes that's a buzzword that gets overused a little bit, I realize. But you can actually go out and purchase ransomware as a service kit. There's a, a screenshot of one there. They're with different levels of technical expertise needed, sometimes even different payment models. You know, there's even some market segmentation around having, you know, do you purchase it up front? Do you go and actually, you know, you take 80% and 20% goes back to the person who wrote it? This is where, for me, when I was looking at this space and researching, I found it really fascinating because my, my career even is going from you know, customer to partner to vendor. I work at Pure Storage now, right? And so you see that kind of value chain of people that write products and then partners, solutions integrators, you know, help get them out of the marketplace to customers. Because when you get hit by ransomware, you have actually become a customer. And that's the last interesting thing here. There have actually been customer service improvements, which is crazy to think about. There's a company named F5 the way and got infected by five ransomware variants. They did it you know, correctly and VMs didn't pay the ransom. And they actually wrote a case study about the level of customer service that they got. Everything from you know the equivalent of maybe a grandmother in the Midwest who doesn't know how to use Bitcoin to a, a, you know, maybe a teenager who doesn't want his parents to know what he was doing to a young professional who's got to get that PowerPoint out the door. And actually there are help desks, professional help desks and even call centers behind some of these products. And they actually found that it was actually a very good level of customer service. Last but not least, as so I put my IT practitioner, I'm still, I'm always learning, always a student, and I look at the industry, I look at what I did as a customer. 
And I think about how this is a business, it's a growing business, a maturing business that competes with you. What do I mean when I say that? So if you asked me when I was a customer, is everything in your data center up to date and patched and kept current all the time? I just, I don't like that question. That's an extremely uncomfortable question because I know how much I have to do every single day. There's nonstop things going on. And so when we look at this space, there are people with the ability and the motivation. And this is why when I, I said this five years ago, that I didn't see this slowing down in the near term. And unfortunately, that has turned out to be the case, sadly. Right. Now, I hope that you'll come back and join us for parts two and three. This was meant to be a somewhat agnostic walkthrough of the landscape, things that have changed, attack vectors in section two. Please join us, we'll dive into defense in depth and how you can have some hope and how you can protect and then how Pure can help you. Thanks for listening.